I'm interviewing women that I admire, respect, and I know that we can learn from. My role is to bring out their best practices, their routines, their habits, their thought processes, so that you and I can apply what we learn to improve our lives. We're also going to travel back in time to look at where they came from. How did they attain their skills? What were the thoughts back then? What would they give their younger self? So join me. Today we're speaking with Commander Kelly. Mary Kelly is also known as a fun leadership economist. She does motivational leadership speaking for productive leaders. She is going to share with you how she knew she was destined to be a speaker. And you'll be surprised what her parents' philosophy was and how that contributed to her ability to manage and cope with high stress environments. And you will never guess who inspired her to get into the Navy. She is very organized, very efficient, and she's gonna share some of those practices with you. So listen carefully. <laughs> we think back to your childhood. When was the first signs that you saw um, that gave you the skills to be in your industry now? Well, I knew that I was destined to do some professional speaking because after church on Sundays, I would go home and tell my parents how I would have delivered the sermon. You're kidding me. I'm not. Like at age 8, 9, 10, my parents would say, so what did you get out of church? And I would repeat what the minister said, and then I would reframe it with my story and my ideas and my interpretation. No way. I want a <laughs> verification. <laughs> it's a little geeky, isn't it? It's what, a little geeky. What did your parents do? Because, I mean, you had to... They had to, that had to come from somewhere. I had great parents. I still have great parents. They're still alive. I'm very blessed. And there's four of us. And my parents raised four very independent, very confident kids. My parents said, do something even if it's wrong. And to me, that was, oh. I know. My parents What's were, that mean? My parents were more worried about the fact that they wanted us to take risks. They yeah. wanted us to try and fail rather than not do anything at all. Safe, safe is okay, but safe doesn't get you very far. And if you're both, safe, you might be safe in the harbor, but boats aren't supposed to be in a harbor. Boats are supposed to be at sea. And it was that kind of mentality. And my parents were very, not just forgiving, but supportive when we would try something and fail. And I think in a lot of ways now, people don't try and fail because they're afraid to fail. People don't want to feel like failure. And my parents made it okay for us to fail. Wow. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, um, in the speaking that you're doing now, what kind of messages are you sharing that mes message? I do. I have a, programs on leadership. And so everybody talks about leadership, and I know everybody talks about mm -hmm. leadership. But I'm an economist. My PhD is in economics. So from my perspective, leadership is only helpful if it's going to help improve profit growth or organizational growth or something. You can be the best leader ever. It's like singing in the shower. If you sing great in the shower and you're Celine Dion and you only sing in the shower, it's really not doing the world a whole lot of good. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I feel about leadership is leadership is all encompassing and it's also a great leader knows how to do teamwork and change management and process improvement and feedback and employee interaction and all that. And that ultimately leads to business growth. And that's what I focus on. Let's go back to your your um, your church days and presentations. So after, what were the next steps? Knowing that you're going to be a speaker, you're going to be evangelizing something. Something. And, like, something. Take us well, through some of that. So after I, I went through high school and then I went to the Naval Academy and. And in the Naval Academy, you learn how to deal in a high-stress, high-pressure environment. I have great classmates, and we're all still really close. It's fantastic. And some of my classmates have gone on. One's going back into space next month. She's amazing. Going back into space? Where are you off to now? Off to I, space? I know. She's amazing. She's an astronaut. And then my other classmates are, you know, just they run big companies like, you know, 24 Hour Fitness and USAA, they're, they're big parts of the board, and I've got great classmates and very talented. But we all went through this high stress environment. And then I did 21 years on active duty in the Navy. So you're called on frequently in the military to go talk to groups of people, parents of deployed people, spouses, there was a lot of talking. And I was always one of those people who never minded the talking in front of other people. So when you're that person, you kind of get tacked, you know, you know, tagged with that idea that oh, we can always call, we can always call Commander Kelly. She can always go do this talk. And when I was back at the Naval Academy, that was my last tour in the Navy. Um, I was asked to do a lot of the public speaking. So that wound up being really good for me. And then companies who heard me speak when I was on active duty then called me afterwards and said, oh, we've got this conference, we've got a convention, we've got this group, can you come talk to them? That's kind of how I started. Now, what inspired you to get into the Navy? Oh, John Denver songs. 
All my life decisions were of made course. from John Denver songs. Of course. Uh, he sings Calypso, I joined the Navy, and, and now I live in Colorado, partly because he sang Rocky Mountain High. It has nothing to do with pot. And <laughs> just wanted to say that. I didn't know that was about pot. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. But oh, you know, okay. Rocky Mountain High, and then you yeah. know, we legalized pot. Oh, oh Lord. Mm -hmm. Really? So I thought the Navy was romantic. I liked the idea of being at sea. Romantic in terms of the ocean and the sky and just being out independent. And it's a cool feeling. And I haven't done, a, a lot of people have done lots more sea time than me. I need to caveat that. But I think it's great to be out on a ship in the middle of the ocean and be independent and be able to function. So I was very fortunate. What kind of um, skills could be parlayed into the, from, from the Navy experience to the land life? You would think that they would not cross over, but they absolutely do. And first off, we have to run bases. And a large base has a lot of moving parts. There's, you know, there's a shipyard, there's, there's civilian workers, there's military workers, there's families who live there, and it's big money, big buildings, big people, big movements. When you're trying to move people for war, that's a lot of moving parts. The logistics are incredible. And we think about, you know, think about at home, when your internet's a little spotty, yeah. you're like, oh, stupid cable, you reset the router, call mm -hmm. the company. Yep. Okay, now imagine you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean. How are you going to get internet? How are you going to get secure communications? How are you going to do that? It's a whole host of other problems. And so the Navy teaches you things like problem solving. They teach you resource allocation. They help you develop those skills that are very applicable in the business world. And guess what? We've got... In the business world, you generally get to choose your employees or somebody else has screened those employees. Yeah, we don't get to choose. You get what you get and then you have to work with them. So that whole idea of dealing with difficult people, which is a very difficult, you know, very, very popular topic right now, is huge. And the Navy taught me a lot of that. And I got to practice. And that's what a lot of people don't get to do is they don't get to really practice those skills. And so you get into something and not only do you get to practice, but you've got somebody watching out over you so that they can, you can go in and yeah. go, hey boss, I've got this idea, or I've got this, this employee, am I doing the right thing? And, and there's a, you're expected to ask your boss for advice on these things, and they're expected to help you, not just say, oh gosh, that's your problem, you should go deal with it. So the military is a really good, good place to learn terrific leadership skills that are across all business, uh, across all business issues. Um, and then the entrepreneurship side is yeah. problem solving. Yeah, as I'm seeing that isolation, that you have to do all your things. Mm -hmm. I am, um, it's probably not appropriate, but I'm, I'm divorced, and so I have to do all these other things, so I'm learning, oh, how to fix this, how to hang a door. Because of isolation a little bit, mm -hmm. you, you need to do all these problem solving. And, and it you learn the things. And so, you of do. course, you're an entrepreneur because mm -hmm. you've learned all that. Mm -hmm. Did not know. Mm -hmm. And my, my father ran a business. And he started his business in his 50s, which is very risky when you think about that. Yeah. With kids to support and all that. Four of them. And, right. And he started this business that was very successful. Um, and he still, I'll call him sometimes and ask him for, you know, advice. He likes it when I do that. Sorry, Dad, but you do like that. <laughs> and uh, he loves it when I call him for advice on things. Of course. And, and that's the thing. Sometimes I think we forget that when we ask for help, especially sometimes as women, we think if we ask for help, it's a sign of weakness. And in reality, asking for help or asking for advice, not being that needy, mm -hmm. whiny person that always needs something that nobody wants to talk to, that's not what I'm talking about. But people who need advice, or ask, ask other people, you know, say, hey, can I take two minutes of your time? I'd really like to ask your advice on something. I'd value your opinion. And then, you, but then if you, if you ask too many times and then you don't do anything, mm -hmm. yeah. and this is where I see a problem, people like, they like the idea of getting advice from somebody who is in a big position, mm -hmm. but then they don't do anything with it. So right. that person, that position, is going to cut you off after a while. Wasted breath, yeah. It's wasted breath, and they don't want to waste their time. Yeah. And they feel like if you're wasting their time, that's not okay. So if you're going to ask somebody advice, my advice on that is say, I'd like two minutes of your time. I will not take more than two minutes for a very specific issue. Don't just go in and go, oh, I want to do better with my life. Mm -hmm. No. Quantify. Quantify it. Figure it out. Mm -hmm. In terms of women, what um, what does my audience need to know in terms of being stronger? You have that you have that military background, and you've had to be independent. What are a couple of tips in order to to stand up and to problem solve instead of being afraid? Like, how can we um, give them a couple of tips to get there? So my dad used to say, "Plan your work and work your plan." And it sounds so simple, but most people don't plan their days, and it makes me insane. 
Why in the Let's world? Let's hold on just a second. Yeah. <clears throat> Start over. Yeah, well, yeah, let's start with the plan. So. Mm -hmm. And there we go. <laughs> My dad used to say, plan your work and work your plan. And that makes a lot of sense and it's so simple, but most people don't do it. And it makes me insane because I ask people when I coach them, my executive coaching, I say, take me through your day. And the Sometimes they're loss of what they actually did because they're wasting a ton of time because they know they have all these things that they have to do and then they get into their desk or they get in their office and they've got all the things they have to do mm -hmm. and they should do to move their business forward. But it's easier to do all these other little things. I'm like, mm. you know what? Nothing important ever gets done in your free time. You want to write a book, you schedule it. And then you sit your butt in that chair during that time and you write. There's none of like, well, I don't feel like doing it. You're never going to feel like doing it. And if it's something that you continue to procrastinate because you're just not motivated to do it, then guess what? Maybe that's not what you should be doing. Maybe that's not it. So I had, I had three coaching clients and three in the last couple of years when I said, you know what, you need to get out of this business. They, they were horrified. They said, but, but my family and this, that, and I've done this so long. I'm like, you know what, you're awful at this and you hate it and you're sick to your stomach every day when you have to go do these things. It's, it's completely against what you should be doing. You have to find what you should be doing, not what everybody else says you should be doing. And then all those things on your to-do list suddenly become a lot easier. It's kind of like school. You know when you're muddling through school and you're taking all these courses that you don't really like and then you find your major? Usually your major's courses for you are easier because it's things you're good at. It's things that you naturally like. And I think we have to figure that out for our career. I have a, a tool for this. I have what's called a five minute career plan. And it's on my website. Can I say my website? Oh please, please Okay, do. It's ProductiveLeaders.com. ProductiveLeaders.com. And if you go to the area called Free Stuff, mm -hmm. there's a five minute career plan that helps people kind of identify those things. And then there's a five minute business plan for our entrepreneurs yeah. who want to figure out how to move their business forward. And then I think I've got my five minute year in review, which is, okay, all oh, that stuff yeah. that you thought about doing last year and you kind of didn't get around to, or the things that you really accomplished, Let's articulate that and figure out where you're going to go. And again, they're just five minute plans. They're all one page long. People love them because they're, they're achievable. You can yeah. sit down with your friends and say, with your mastermind group, your board of directors and say, hey, I want to plow through my, my business plan. I want to really get focused. Help me with my five minute plan or look at my five minute plan or talk to me about yeah. my five minute plan. And it's the basis for um, a lot of the coaching that I do. I start them with all those plans. And so they're free. They're free resources on my website. How do women sabotage themselves? Women occasionally sabotage themselves in the professional environment by not focusing enough on work. And I know that there's people out there who say, oh, but I've got a family, I've got this, I've got that, that's fine. But at work, you owe that person who hired you their, that time, that attention, that focus. And that's got to be the focus. And some women do things in the workplace that cause people to not trust them so much or value them as much. And men do it too, but sometimes women will talk about it. And remember, we as women, in order to think, we have to articulate. So our way of getting through problems is to talk them through. Mm -hmm. We talk through problems. This is why when women go home at the end of the day and the man asks, how was your day? We wow. feel like we should tell them. Yeah. <laughs> we feel like we Thanks should tell them. And, and the man, if you ask a man, how was your day? He's going to say, Good. Good. Fine. Yeah. And that's the end because they don't need to articulate and process through those things. Women also don't process cortisol, you know, our stress hormone, as fast as men. Men process it 10 times longer than we do. So we tend to hang on to emotional issues longer. Is that is that like um, there's a situation and then ah, and the guy is like ah and, and then, then they're asleep. 5 minutes later they're they're, they're done. asleep. They're done. Okay. Or if you've and if you've ever been with a guy and you have an argument and then they go to sleep right afterwards, you're like, why are you sleeping? I'm and because we're yeah. still in this turmoil. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is us, and so we tend to do that in the workplace, and we need to just mm. recognize that there's differences, and we need to communicate based on the way they get communication, not what's good for us. So we tend to communicate 
in a way that is best for how we want to be communicated with. Mm -hmm. And the reality is you have to communicate at work with people the way they best receive and get information. Because if you give somebody too much information and they're too busy, yeah. they're like, oh gosh, I don't want to talk to her because it's going to be a 20 minute conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And instead your boss needs to say, you know what, I need 30 seconds. I need a 30 second update or a one minute update or whatever. And sometimes it's text or email or phone call or face to face. But we, we sabotage ourselves by not asking, hey boss, how do you want me to best give you information? How often do you want it? When do you want me to do it? And how do you want me to deliver it? Just ask. Uh -huh. I was going to say, yeah, well, how can women learn about um, men and communication and ourselves? By asking, that's a simple way. But mm -hmm. all, how, what other resources? You've, you've worked with a lot of men mm -hmm. in your, all of your history, but if you're not... Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate. So I remember yeah. being, and I tell this story sometimes in my groups, that we as women are not as direct with communication as men. And it's just how we are. And I was studying with one of my male classmates at the Naval Academy, and his roommate came in, and we were studying on a desk. There's only one desk at the time. And he puts his feet up on the desk. And my buddy looks at you know, his roommate and says, get your bleepity bleep yeah. feet off the desk. And, and I'm sitting there going, oh gosh, this is going to be... And the guy just took his feet off the desk, went, okay. <laughs> and I thought, that would never happen in women world. You know, that would never happen in women world. We would just think about it. We'd go, oh, and we'd, pent we'd have pent up irritation and all that. And then, then it, the last straw would happen, and then we'd, our head would explode. And, you know, then we'd be like, you're always doing this. You always leave your socks on the floor. You're and, and their way's better. And it's a lot less stress. And it's clearer communication. And I think sometimes we as women, in our desire to be liked, we. We d are not clear with communication. And you don't have to be mean, but you do have to be clear. And sometimes we think, well, if we just, if we hint around the issue, then they'll well, get If we give it. them clues. We'll give them clues. <laughs> and, and men are more direct. And we need, I think we need to be more direct. And it, you can do that in the nicest possible way. So if one of your employees or somebody you're working with isn't meeting a deadline or mm -hmm. you need them to focus more on a certain aspect, you can say, you know, we've got this project happening and it's due on Friday. I need your help on this. I need this report in because it's due on Friday or Consequences due on Friday and help. Right. Give them a because. I need this because this. And be really clear. And you don't have to give a lot of words, mm -hmm. but I need this by Friday because I have to work this to get this done. Oh, okay. And then people will respond to that. But be clear instead of, well, you know that report's due next week. Okay. That doesn't tell them anything. Yeah. But we kind of hint around it hoping right, they'll right, get it. Right. Yeah, don't hope. Be direct. <laughs> be more direct and be clear. Yeah. And I think, again, we, a lot of women like want to be liked more than respected. And I think it's more important to be respected than to be liked because yeah. it's great to be liked and we all want to be liked, but business is not, not the Miss America pa pageant. It's not. There's no Miss Congeniality in business. And being respected is really important. So I just want to emphasize when you go back to, uh, to when you were 25 years old, mm -hmm. are you there? Mm -hmm. I'm 25 <laughs> years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. What would you tell your 25-year-old self? Um, my 25-year-old self, gosh, so when I was 25, mm -hmm. I had already been to several countries in Asia. I had already um, been stationed in a few places in Asia. And my 25-year-old self was invincible. Oh, I loved my 25-year-old body. <laughs> I did. Oh, I, oh, I loved my 25-year-old body. I was in shape. I was thin. Oh, all that. Um, and that 25-year-old person made the one thing that I did. The, I have very few regrets in my life, but every regret comes from a place of arrogance. Mm. And I haven't had too many of those I'm happy about, but there are a couple moments in my life where I was arrogant and that did not result well. I said something to someone that wasn't the right thing mm -hmm. or I was trying to feel more important mm -hmm. and my 25-year-old self needed to guard against that. So I would caution my 25-year-old self about a little bit of pride. And mm -hmm. that, so I got hit upside the head a few times on that one and hopefully I've learned from my 25-year-old self mistakes. And you know, we learn all the time, but oh, yeah, I do miss my 25-year-old body. <laughs> I'd be like, like, enjoy that body now. It doesn't last forever. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, you had mentioned daily, um, daily life for, mm -hmm. for a moment. Let's look at your daily life. Okay. How do you start your day and, and close your day? Because you're quantifying, you're being clear, mm -hmm. 
You sound very organized. Mm -hmm. How do you start your day? I sound organized. So the <laughs> and you're right. And the reality is, I since I was about 12 years old, I carried around a yellow legal pad, and I make notes in a yellow legal pad. And I still I in my it. life, I, I know it. it. It's insane. And still, I carry around a yellow legal pad. So it was funny when I went back to teach at the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. I went back. There were people who I remember. They go, "Oh my gosh, you're still carrying around a yellow legal pad." And I make little boxes and I check things off. And I need it, but I wanted something more organized, more taxonomized in mm -hmm. categories. Taxonomized. Taxonomized. Woo! Not to be confused with taxidermy, that's a whole yeah. different other yeah. thing. Yeah. So I created a productivity sheet. And it's also in the free resources. And it's product because I did it for yeah. me, because yeah, yeah. I needed it. Yeah. And there's a block for um, calls to make, to mm -hmm. do for the day, mm -hmm. follow up appointments and then short-term accomplishments and then some long-term goals and if you do that every single day yeah it really organizes your day and then you've got these sheets maybe the stuff from last yesterday or the last mm -hmm. week and what I do is I print off one of those sheets every day mm -hmm. I three-hole punch it and then I put everything I have to do that day and then the if I need to if I'm working on a book I spend I write spend 45 minutes on this book spend you know 30 minutes doing this but spend whatever and I map out the time and so my day is planned and I and so then if I've got five minutes then I look at it and I say okay that's a call I can make or that's a text I can make or that's an email I can answer now what throws us off our schedule yeah is email we get up in the morning and we've all got 300 emails and we've got things to respond to and phone calls and then someone will call us and say, hey, can you come to this conference? And all of a sudden that shifts yeah, our schedule. Right. So you have to plan your day knowing that there's going to be shifts. But that doesn't mean you, plan, you don't plan your whole day. You do plan the day. But if something Flex comes time, in, yeah. you need to say, okay, here is my work time and what am I going to do? So if I don't have someone to respond to, then that's when I say, okay, if I've got this 45 minutes, that means that's outbound communication, that's someplace I have to go, uh, you know, that's me looking for business. But my day starts early. Uh, Navy training as well helps that. So I get up about, um, about 5.30, 6 every morning. Mm -hmm. um, I love my coffee. I love my coffee. And I have my, my cappuccino, my espresso. I just got a new machine. I'm so happy with it. And I sit with my coffee. I take the dogs outside. The dogs get fed computer gets turned on and as I'm having coffee and the dogs are eating I go through the email and I triage my emails so I go through and I, I delete everything that I can delete really fast or mm -hmm. it takes less than 10 seconds to get through boom 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 get through that and then anything else that needs some attention I highlight that and I move it to the top of my my email box mm -hmm. and depending upon where you are in the country I currently sort of living in Colorado, so I can make phone calls to the East Coast. <laughs> sort of, kind of. Okay. Sort of, kind of living in Colorado. Right. So I can make calls to the East Coast, you know, at 6 o'clock yeah. in the morning, and then it's their morning time, so that's perfectly great. So I can return phone calls then, I schedule that, I look at the time, and then I might get a, a very short workout in. Um, after that, you know, a very short workout, that's a quick 20, 30 minutes, yeah. or whatever, and then, but while I'm doing that, that's when I catch up on the news, that's when I look at reading. There's, I multitask, and I know that people say you shouldn't multitask, but okay frankly it's boring to walk it's boring to run so right, I, I'm with you so I multitask I read I go through stuff and and I, I might plot out an article when I'm doing that you know when you're trying to run and it's kind of hard to write or whatever I might dictate an article and I do a lot of that and here's the big secret weapon um, here's two secret weapons I have to do a lot of writing most of us do so I'm a better speaker in terms of talking than mm -hmm. I am writing for simply time, I'm not a fast typer. So I pull out my phone, send an email to myself, and dictate what I want to write. You can bang out so many articles that way, you can do your blog that way, you can do all that that way. And you can respond, and then you've got it all typed out, and then when you're off the treadmill or something like that, then you go into your email, copy, paste, clean it up, boom, send it out. Huge time saver. I like to see a video, there's Mary Kelly, she's on her treadmill, you know, her dog's over here, <laughs> listening to the news. Doing this it's thing here and then like way. eating at the same time. It, it's, I, yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. It kind of is. But it's how my life works. Yeah, and yeah. Not, it's not going to work for everybody. Sure, for sure. sure. <laughs> Guys, no. I mean, sorry, no. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's some multitasking that you, you can do. Right. And I always have something in my bag that I can do in five minutes. I have what's called my five minute plans, but also my five minute jobs. So I always carry thank you notes. I always carry, um, you know, gift cards that I can put in the thank you Because you may have to wait. You right. may wait for a second. I love that. I always have jobs I can do while I'm waiting that's not wasting time. Because time for me, <laughs> everything, everything, yes. Yes. right? 
time is, you know, um, our life is a finite number of unknown minutes. So we can't waste them. We can't waste them. So I try very hard not to. I decided I was not really going to spend a lot of my time with people I don't like. Mm -hmm. um, in my business, we don't deal with mean people. If somebody is mean, and I'm not talking just gruff or angry or abrupt, I mean, you know, that day, but mean, mm -hmm. we don't work with them. We say, you know what, we're probably not the right fit for you. And it's not because I'm, I mind the conflict. In the Navy, we get conflict. That's not the issue. But our life, my team, mm -hmm. our life is too short. And I'm not going to put my people through working with people who are going to be abusive or mean or yeah. ugly to them. Why would we do that? So, and, and I'm not, I'm not saying, I love a tough audience. I love a tough audience. I mean, I've talked in front of Congress and all that. But, um, but people who are mean don't have time for it in my life. Just don't. Last question. Yes. Do you have a bucket list item that you're ready to execute this year in the near future? So I'm coming out with another book, mm -hmm. which is very exciting. I've always wanted to co-author a book, and I'm co-authoring a book called Why Leaders Fail, and I'm co-authoring it with Peter Stark, and it's a huge honor to be working with him. And that's that's on the bucket list. So my, a lot of people's bucket list has to do with travel. Yeah. The Navy was great to me in terms of travel. I got to go to amazing places. Mm -hmm. um, I had always wanted to, as a little kid, fly on and off a carrier, so I got that one off the list. Um, uh, last year, I got to go to Machu Picchu in Peru, mm -hmm. and so that was on the bucket list. And I love travel. I'm crazy about travel. So my bucket list, a lot of people have you know, the, the leisure idea and the yeah. travel, and my bucket lists also tend to be very business-oriented. Mm -hmm. And I love the fun of a book launch. I know that's crazy. It's a ton of work, and it's crazy. But I love sort of the excitement around a new product. It's kind of like a new puppy. You know, it's like, <laughs> woohoo, we can make it anything we want. So what's this about? It's why leaders fail, and there are the seven I deadly sins. Obviously, but. It's the seven deadly sins of leadership, and there's a book out called The Seven Deadly Sins of Leadership, and mm -hmm. they got that title before we did, which was sad. But it's seven reasons why leaders sabotage themselves, um, usually unintentionally, and then what you can do to fix it. And this is what we see in our executive coaching clients a, a lot, especially at the more senior levels. And it's things that they do that they don't realize that they're just they're stabbing themselves in the foot and usually destroying the teams around them. So it's, it's been a really great process. I'm really fortunate. Where can we find all of your properties, your online properties? I'm at ProductiveLeaders.com. Productive Leaders, so you don't want unproductive leaders. Right. So ProductiveLeaders.com. And if you go to free resources, it's all there. There's a lot of resources there. And So here's the confession on that. I put everything for free on my website because I needed a repository for my stuff. <laughs> I needed a place yeah. where I could always find my yeah. own stuff if I was on the road. Right. So putting it on my website made perfect sense. So all the forms that I use, my profit and loss statements, you know, the templates, mm -hmm. my business plan templates, the big ones, my, my little ones, um, articles I use all the time, I started putting them in my free stuff so that I always knew where they were. I know. Functional. Very functional. And people said, well, other people could steal that. I was like, God bless them. That's great. Use Take them. It. Take it. Use it. Use whatever you want. It's fantastic. Mary Kelly, thank you. Thanks.